Good morning. It's Friday, November 6, 2015. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 222. How the is that is that possible? Have I yeah. Yeah, that's the number. I've done 222 of these, but not just me. I'm joined, of course, always by a cast of characters. And we got a great one today. Hey there, Andrews. <laughs> Yay, I'm a cast of characters. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Friday. Happy Friday. You made it in here. Very, very well done. Yep. Uh, and of course, as always, we're also fully loaded with a mumble room. Time appropriate greetings. Mumble room. Hey there, Hello, Hello. <laughs> Hello cast of characters. Friday. Happy Friday. Hey, you know, it wouldn't be uh, a Friday without a shower thought, right? We all have them. Angela is here today with her shower thought Friday. A lethal dose is also a lifetime supply. (laughs) Very good. That, ladies and gentlemen, is Tech Talk Friday Shower Thought. (laughs) All right, so uh, we've got a lot of news to get into. I'm starting to uh, get a little nervous uh, because, you know, I I travel to System 76 next week. Mm -hmm. And I should probably say right now, at the top of the show, I apologize, that means there won't be a show next week. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. But I'm literally going to be flying... To Colorado. Well, I'll be flying back Friday. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I was just looking at my flight times. It's like uh, 8.07 a.m. is when I leave Wednesday morning. I know. So there won't be an unfilter either. And yeah. then I fly out, like, I, I land, like, at 9.30 p.m. or I something know. like that. It's yep. And then, you know, of course, we live, uh, what, how, how far away would you say LaConnor is from? Uh, oh, geez. Two and a half Two and a half hours. hours from the yeah, airport? I would say. Yeah. Between two and two and a half, yeah. Yeah, and we're going to try to make it down to the airport, I don't know, crazy. 7, 6.30 a.m. to make it through security. Yep. And Labor Day. Or no, not Labor Veterans. Day. Veterans. Veterans Day. Yeah. yeah. Jeez, so I'm On getting a little holiday. nervous. And you know, to be honest with you, and, and you know this is the truth, I hate traveling by plane so much. Yes. This is, it was a major reason I got the Rover. <laughs> yeah. And, uh... It's not that I really hate the flying aspect of it, although m- there is like this little part of me that's like, how can human beings create a machine that is working this flawlessly that keeps us up in the air like this? <laughs> this does not seem possible. There's too many moving parts, right? Yeah. So there is that little bit of that although in me. Although you would jump at the chance to be on like a 1701D. You know? Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Like no, you wouldn't even question yeah. it at all. No, You'd be like, yeah, yeah. This is solid. I know yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's fine. No, but you see, uh, for what it really is, the, it's the security check. It's the total, it's oh, yeah. the total it's loss the of. Deal. It's the loss of all governance over yourself, having to submit to the process mm-hmm. and, the, and, and, and the industries and their delays and all of that. What? Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody. Exactly. So when I, uh, so, but the way this uh, super fan contest worked out for System 76, there's just no way to really make a road trip over there in time. And not only that, I just wasn't jazzed at the ideas of the Rockies in November. <laughs> right. Like, you know, I've got more than 5,000 pounds behind yeah. me pushing me down I, the mountain. And you don't have chains. No, exactly. So, yeah, like I don't even know how to put chains on. Prep, yeah. Well, I, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say it that way, but I'm like, you know, what? I'm not going to be mean. Thanks, I, I appreciate want, that. Yeah, yeah no thank problem. you. Yeah. So yeah, I I I had to you know fly, and thankfully System 76 is covering that and the hotel, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah but uh, it does feel like I, I feel like I'm cheating on the rover a little bit. Yeah, it hurts. Yeah, I, well, and you have to put it in storage while you're gone. Yeah, and I'll tell you the truth. Uh, if this was at a different time of year, I think I would prefer to just drive it. So I'm a little nervous. I'm getting a little anxious. So we have this show, and then. Friday Friday, you know, it's Friday, so then we're doing Linux Action Show. We're doing our Fedora 23 review today. And then I got Monday, I got Coda Radio. Tuesday, I got Linux Unplugged, which I should, I, I'll probably just be sedated with beer because Wes will bring some <laughs> beer. And then, and then, I'm, on, then I'm hitting the road for yeah. a little while. Yep. I'm, I'll be, we'll be doing Linux Action Show from uh, and System 76. And you double, <laughs> double tech snap last week, so yeah. no tech snap Yeah, next the tech week. snaps are going to air uh, at its regular yeah. time, but it's already recorded. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm. Although I'm really excited to see some of their rigs. Although I'm probably gonna want to buy something. I won't. And do yeah, and do <laughs> his action show on site. Yeah, that's gonna be fun. Yeah. Yeah, and hopefully we'll get a chance to chat with Carl. He's a really sharp guy, and I don't know how many of the audience members have met Carl, the guy behind System76. Mm-hmm. So that should be cool. All right, well, speaking of computer hardware companies, why don't we get into the news? This one's an interesting one. A historic computer company is splitting into two. Helio Packard. Uh, HP Is it now s- going to be Hewlett and Packard? No, that wouldn't make sense. It's, <laughs> it's actually going to be HP <laughs> Inc. and Heliot Packard Enterprise. Those are the two companies. Heliot? Yeah, Heliot Packard. Uh, uh, it will sell personal computers, <laughs> HP Inc., and then the Heliot Packard Enterprise will sell commercial computer systems, software, big systems. Uh, so one company is basically betting the farm on printers and personal devices, and one company is basically betting the farm on the Enterprise. HP Inc. will sell those computers like printers and the devices like printers, 
Uh, you're going to look at large enterprise RAID storage, commercial computer, computer systems and software like HBUX. That'll be at Heliot Packard Enterprise. This starts next Monday. They'll what, each start trading separately on the New York Stock Exchange. What is uh, Daredevil? What did you have to say about that? I wonder if that ha doesn't have to do with the fact that Google also made that move on separating and pretty much being multiple small companies instead of just one big one. Hmm. Yeah, and that's, also a, that's a good observation, although market. I think HP's actually been kind of working on this for several CEOs. I think, it's, I think they've been kind of moving this way for a few years now. I'm not just saying as a copying scenario, it's also a legal scenario in some sides of the pond. For example, in the European Union side, there is some legal advantage of actually having those divisions. Sure, yeah. Rather than having that uh, big lump sum. Yeah, Files Copy mentions HP did kind of announce they'd be doing something like this last year, and we did cover that story. And here's how the breakout's going to work. <clears throat> HP's current chief executive, he's the guy who has really been pushing for the split, says the spinoffs will be more uh, nimble. And uh, CEO Meg Whitman will run HP Enterprise, so he's gonna he's gonna take over the uh, div, uh, the consumer or uh, uh, Diane Wesler. I can't, I can't. I always get bad on the names. I hate doing the names. Why do I even bother doing the names? Yeah, people. But he's Important a PC. People over there. He's a PC industry veteran. <laughs> uh, so Dion, I think is how you say his name. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. I don't know. But anyways, I just th that's not the part that matters. The part that matters is that freaking HP is splitting into two, and it really seems like they're, in my opinion, struggling to stay relevant. We've watched them fumble with uh, with the uh, uh, WebOS acquisition. We've watched them fumble really with the whole smartphone. They, HP's like one of the biggest contenders that really has nothing in the race there. Uh, they just uh, have kind of been left behind recently. And, you know, the personal computer business is mm -hmm. sort of deflating a little bit. Yeah, as tablets. And yeah, well, and just be they're good enough. I don't even know if it's really tablets. I mean, I'm sure tablets contribute just like Chromebooks do. But I think it's more, you know, you like the laptop you have is going to last you years. Mm -hmm. It's plenty good for years. Really what's going to happen first is you'll run out of storage before the processor isn't fast enough or it doesn't have enough RAM. Mm -hmm. You know, so computers, computers today aren't like computers of yesterday. Yep, and that's uh, that's just legit. That's just you know back in the day when we had uh, dial up and uh, oh my gosh had to connect out to like services like AOL. Then yeah, computers needed to be constantly upgraded because you know you're going from 33.6 to 56k, and then you had V.92, so that way you wouldn't get kicked off when if you Man, had two lines and technology moves so fast. Yeah, and I mean like it's faster now, but like. <laughs> Yeah, we went through so many. Yeah, today you know you get your same internet connection lasts you for a couple of years before any changes are made to it. Uh, your computer is going to be good enough for years. So I just think the PC market is slowing down, and HP hasn't managed to find another really profitable revenue stream in the consumer market. Unrelated, but related, sort of. I was making calls from my desk yesterday for for work, and I was using my headphones. And so I put my headphones in, and then I went to dial the number on my cell phone. And I was like, why don't I hear the the, the tones? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> wow, I am so, like, how does that even, like, I don't know. Yeah, that's good. That is uh, that is a sign of the times. All right, so uh, I wondered, <clears throat> you know, every now and then we have these stories that uh, are basically are complete reversals of Google's core philosophy around Android, and I can't help sit here and go, well, wait, 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 wait isn't this a tacit admission that Apple's way was better? And I, I, I often look at the way Android One is set up from a uh, OEM and chip control manufacturing standpoint, or the way they've now done Android Wear as examples of this. But this might be even more fundamental because it's more of a foundational thing, and it's like one of the core reasons why I, I happen to think the iPhone is pretty good hardware. It's the A9 chip in the new iPhone success and the A8 and the previous, and, and really since the A7, I think Apple has had a clear advantage in their whole system on a chip. I'm talking everything from the GPU to the CPU to the way everything works together. Well, apparently Google thinks that as well. And so they are working to have their own smart chip designs. And this is uh, kind of coming out uh, all over the place by two different articles by the information. And I have that linked in the show notes, but you have to have like a $1,000 a year subscription to read it. Wow. Woohoo! But <laughs> thankfully, uh, guess who uh, has a subscription and can write about it? Ars Technica. So uh, they've broken it down for us here. The report sh uh, says that uh, the discussions happened last year between fall, or <laughs> in fall, uh, between Google representatives, and they put forward designs of chips that it was interested in co-developing, including the phone's main processor. The new chips are reportedly needed for future Android features that Google hopes to release in the next few years. So they're like getting the groundwork laid down right now. 
Uh, the report specifically calls out virtual and augmented reality as use cases for the new chips. Publicly, only Google Cardboard has surfaced from Google's VR initiative, which got a big boost yesterday. Uh, Google rolled out VR support across YouTube on their uh, Android app. Hmm. And so Google Cardboard is this design you can get online. You take a piece of cardboard or you buy one or you use a thing like my Gear VR headset like I have. And it turns an Android device into a – you put it in oh, yeah. this – yeah, yeah, yeah. And so now if you have the YouTube app, you can turn it in VR mode with this cardboard and watch all YouTube videos essentially in like a theater VR mode. Interesting. Yeah, it's kind of neat. So they just rolled that out yesterday and apparently they want to double down on this. Uh, they say internally it seems like the company is gearing up for a few a huge VR push. Now Google wants to design its own VR and AR chips, presumably to power its new Android virtual reality OS and experimental f- devices like Project Tango. And here's the other thing. They also want to work on the camera sensor because they feel like Apple has a superior lead on the not just the uh, camera uh, lens itself because that's just like m- mostly manufactured by Sony. But the actual image processor and all the all the things behind it. So for the image processor, the report said that Google's interested in camera tech that can scan the environment and push images to Google's cloud-based systems for analysis. How about that, Ange? In real time. That is really cool. The report also a little creepy to the cloud in real time for analysis. The report says Google also requested more powerful sensors so the phone could collect more data on its surroundings. It mentions improved sensor hubs. And wants to standardize or improve the Android Sensor Hub. Google is also looking to add support for new wider range of sensors, including ones that can measure distance, something that would be helpful in VR or augmented reality. The site also notes that Google has hired senior product executives for our executive from Qualcomm, which is the number one uh, Android system on a chip manufacturer right now, along with several engineers from PI Semi, a chip firm that was acquired by Apple, which is why Apple's been kicking so much ass. So they got talent from Qualcomm and CI Pemi. A uh, uh, PA Semi, jeez. <laughs> uh, PA Semi, which is both these companies are like the go-to experts in making these. So, uh, Mumbaroom, any thoughts on Google's initiative to build their own CPU? And is it a tacit admission that Google's I... method is probably right? Or, I mean, I'm sorry, Apple's approach of controlling the, all the chips and standardizing on it is probably right. I, I think the... it's actually a good idea for because yeah, into oh, um, Android is. Good, it's got a lot, but it's a segmented market. If Android were to have their own hardware, then they could sell something that was specifically designed for Android, but also have all the other people out there creating Android. People would flock to the Google branded ones because it would work better with Android than anything else would. Hmm. All right, who else want? I know somebody else wanted to jump in. Go ahead. Well, isn't this a logical development path? I mean, uh, I've been going to a system on a chip. Isn't that a logical next evolutionary step to, to make? Isn't I, I, I don't think it is specifically Apple uh, Apple's brilliant idea that this happens. No, I think what I, I think what I'm trying to get at here is where do we draw the line? When do we stop calling it an open platform? When do we when do we look at it as a a tightly controlled OS that has a massive strategy tax by the company that develops it. And I want to extend so, this conversation forward a little bit, and I want to remind you about the story we saw last week, that Google was going to combine Chrome OS and Android. Wouldn't this be a significant development because they could make an entirely different operating system with an entirely different set of rules to, with their OEMs, and you combine that with control over the CPU and the, all the sensors and the camera modules, and you look at their initiatives there, and you combine that with the potential of combining these two operating systems and an entirely new opportunity to renegotiate all of those play contracts. I, 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 and I look back, I look back at, at Google systematically removing applications from ASOP and, and then making proprietary versions of them, you have to have the Play API and services to use. And it's everything. The calendar, the mail client, the web browser, the camera app, the, the gallery app to view your photos, the mail application. They systematically, one by one, replaced the open source version with proprietary versions and abandoned them. And I, I look at these trends, and I look at their tight control over where... And frankly, the rather bland result you have, because there's really no major differentiator between the different Android Wear uh, devices except for the tacky design. And, and, then you, and, you, and you look at that, and I honestly feel like this is going to be a future version of Android that's going to look very, very different from an open platform, because we're already almost there. Go ahead. Well, I think... 
sorry, I think this is, it just makes sense for Google to start developing their own chips. It's market-wise uh, sensible. It's not even just forget a little bit about, about Android. And they already claimed that it was a rumor about the merge of the both OSs. So when you go and you think about Google making sensors, it makes sense in all of their sectors. It makes sense of they already customize yeah, sure. their data centers. It makes sense on their cars. It makes sense on their Tango project. It makes sense from an advertising custom- advertising data collection standpoint too. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. No, I don't of, disagree. Well, I just I makes think all that sense. It just seems that we are in this moment and creating a scenario that we are causing them the ability to actually see what they can do. <laughs> I guess Honestly, what I what I what I walk away from this as somebody who has. Uh, who has uh, felt shame for wanting to use an mm-hmm. iPhone over an Android device at times? Uh, we and and then the the, the longer time goes on, uh, what what keeps happening is the model of approach that was designed to create a robust consumer electronics platform device that can be rapidly updated and and, and be reliable turns out. That mo- and also, by the way, produce compelling updates year after year after year. Turns out the best model to do that was the Apple model. And we all want to hate Apple because they're big and they're evil and they have lots of money and they have a proprietary operating system and they make MacBooks that we can't install Linux on and that's all awful. But at the same time, these moves keep validating the model over and over again, which to me would fundamentally suggest their approach to the smartphone market was a superior approach. Regardless of the OS, regardless of the company behind it, the model they used to approach the market and to deliver a good device appears to be superior and Google has now been spending years trying to get slowly to that model. Well, so to be honest, well, it's remember a different the, approach though. All right, uh, hold on, uh, hold on, one at a time, one at a time. So I just wanted to point out, so Google ran into this problem mostly because of just how open and lenient they were on many of the things they did. So they made these nice open applications. They said, these all work wonderfully. Use them. Then they went and they had people like Samsung doing things, nasty things. Well, and I shouldn't say nasty. You know, things like TouchWiz. Things Their own like experimentations, yeah. Exactly. And then they went and they would say, this is Android. And, you know, Google would say, that's not Android. We didn't make Android like that. So uh, all along the way, all these, you know, major people are going and kind of spitting their own little Android thing, and everyone's kind of going and saying, oh, this Android thing is awful, when really they're just saying, this ta- this TouchWiz thing is awful. Mm-hmm. So Google locks down on some things, says, no, you're right. not screwing No, I understand. I, I, I yeah. kind of see how it worked out. I'm just saying that that was the flaws of their model. Daredevil, though, you wanted to Absolutely. make a point about... Yeah, I uh, actually wanted to make that point, but also add that there's enough competition, there's already enough open source versions of it, so they no longer feel the need. Now they're actually going head to head with Microsofts that are doing apps that are proprietary that target every platform. That's it's interesting. The future yeah. of making this cloud-based world where we have terminals that we connect to their clouds. Based on this future, which is what guarantees their profitability in the in the future, it's just about you know keeping them on the uh, top of the fight. That is a good point, and there are uh, there are more and more open source alternatives. Q, I'll let you add in our last point, and then we'll move on. <laughs> uh, well, I think that we need to understand that Google actually never saw Android as an open platform, as we see open platform. Ap- o- open source for them was only a means, never an end. Uh, so what I mean with that is that uh, the open platform it was only really open for all the vendors, the Samsungs, the HTCs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They could customize Android to their liking as to ensure that Android was getting a huge market share. And they've succeeded in that goal. Uh, Android is absolutely dominant on the market. So now that Android is getting the uh, 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 the negative sides of, these, of this domination that we now see in all kinds of update problems, security holes. Right. Uh, Google is saying, well, okay, let's tie the ropes and get control on the platform itself. Yeah, uh, we know our dominant force. Let's ensure that we can uh, ensure the quality. It's it's the elephant in the room, and then we'll move on. The elephant in the room right now, in my opinion, is marshmallow. Uh, in the time that I know, right? <laughs> yeah, it sounds super yeah. professional. <laughs> yeah. At the time, at the time, Google in the time that Google has released Mars, marshmallow, Apple has released iOS nine and three updates to it, all of which. All of which 
are sitting now at like an 85% user base adoption. And Marshmallow is only shipping on what? Two devices and the new HTC One. I like you can maybe get it on a few devices right now. It's in a, it's not even in the one percent usage right now. Uh, and this is two thousand. This is the this is the operating system they released in the last half of two thousand fifteen. You know, and I have to say that I hate I hate doing those updates because mm-hmm. I have an iPhone. I hated doing all three of those. Yeah, it's too much. Yeah. So there's no way in H E double hockey stick that I will go to an Android. And you know what's funny is uh yeah, it's funny about that is they're getting really Apple's getting like kinda clever about it. Like if you keep saying no later, I don't want to do the update right now, later, later, because I wasn't plugged mm-hmm. in yeah. or I, I right. wasn't on Wi Fi or whatever. I kept saying later and it's like, well, how about we just schedule it for you? And then when you hit that button, it's like after like the third time, it's like, well, how about I just take care of this? And you hit that button and it's like, here's what I'm gonna do. If it's around midnight and you have your phone plugged in and you're on Wi Fi. Can I go ahead and install the update? That's amazing. And then when you say yes, and then it says, all right, well, in order for me to do that, you're going to have to accept the EULA ahead of time, so that way it doesn't get hung up on that. So you agree to that. Wow. And then it just schedules the update to happen later. Huh. That's nice. I just, I don't like that some of the updates seem to undo some of my preferences. Oh, yeah? And Oh, that would, yeah. Yeah. That like, doesn't normally happen to me. I, it's happened a couple I mean, times for me. I'm sure, I'm sure it's like, there's always little things like that that happen with the yeah. updates. Yeah. Well, here's the thing about Apple, though, and this is this is why they have such a great uh, rate of adoption of their updates, and this is why uh, partially why people hate on Apple because uh, one, you when you're competing with Apple in the hardware market, um, it, it almost doesn't matter what you make. You can make a phone that's 10 times better than an iPhone and at you know at half the price you still have to co- compete with Apple's marketing department. I think that's I think doing... that's uh I think that is a MacGuffin. I think that is Well, look at uh, just okay, okay. how I many how many ads just think, look at just look straight forward. How many ads do you see? How many Apple ads do you see? I don't watch TV so uh, and I have ad block I would say here's why I would agree with so. you. Here's why I would agree with you. If they sold 1.9 million iPhones like eight, like uh, Samsung does on an opening weekend or really HTC does, I would agree. 1.9 million devices. I would say if you had the best marketing department in the world or one of the best, you could drive about a million sales, maybe two million sales. Let's give Apple some credit; they got a lot of money. But we're not talking two million sales. We are talking 13, 14, 15 million sales, 20 million sales. You know, we're talking numbers that goes far, far, far beyond what marketing does. Uh, I, I think, and the only reason I bring this up is because I think it actually belittles the volumes we're talking about when you talk about how many devices they sell. Uh, because it sort of implies that the masses are choosing this a, 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 by tens of millions because they've been tricked by clever marketing instead of the product year after year after year has continued to improve and gotten better and continued to deliver on the things it says it can do. And so it has reaffirmed with consumers year after year. And so not only are they drawing a bunch of Android switchers and 60% of iPhone, uh, iPhone 6S buyers were uh, Android switchers, but they are also rebringing new, uh, their customers back again and again and again. And I think all of that is happening completely regardless of marketing. I think in some ways, when you get a, when you get a Samsung S6 uh, and it is so slow that you literally cannot unlock the screen without the screen falling to sleep, I think that does all of the marketing you need to say, gosh, next time I think I might get an iPhone, I hear they have that fingerprint thing that works really well. Even though the S6 might have it, or the S6 might have an 8-core processor, the S6 might be able to be a virtual reality device, and it might have curved edges that are super cool, at the end of the day, when it fails to perform fundamental tasks like that, that's all the advertising that pla- the iOS platform needs. And I, 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 I agree that they have good marketing, but I don't think they have a lot of marketing, and I don't think it's marketing marketing that's driving those tens of millions of sales. There is a difference of just well, doing expensive marketing don't... and doing smart marketing. I mean, what Apple does is product placement really well. Watch a TV show, anyone that it's a higher up is using a Mac. You know, it's like this And you know, it, I would try googling that. And, you know, I'm not sure if because that's really Apple's influence. They don't they actually doesn't they don't pay it's for a, that. It's a, it's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. You they get used to influence people to do this they, and then you stop doing it, it just becomes natural. And it, the consequence yeah. is it stops being a product that people have to advertise that, that they have to advertise for you to get because they have to convince you. It becomes the thing that everyone wants it's to the Walkman. Aim to get. It's the iPod. I don't see that as a problem. People no, <laughs> no, that's what 
they say is, is problem, people, some people is. call all smartphones iPhones, right? It's become like the Kleenex for some right. people. Uh, but that's why that's another thing that drives sales. There's a ton of momentum there too. I agree. All right. There's but, just something that iPhone users do, and I see very few uh, Android users do this. It's just when there's a new version of their phone. Uh, uh, most iPhone users will line up. They will think about buying it, regardless of whether they need uh, need it or not. Whereas what I see Android uh, users doing, and this is what I do, is I get a new phone when my contract comes up for renewal. Yeah, right? I, mean, I think that is still the most common thing. But I think one of the one of the, when a, when a new phone comes out, even all of us in this room. Even though probably none of us, even I don't know, maybe one of our two of us have an iPhone success, but I don't think any of us have an iPhone success. I bet, I bet we could all rattle off a few features because when Apple launches a product, they go this feature, this feature, this feature, and it works. And when Samsung launches a product, they tell you it does this feature, 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 and you look and they go not useful, not useful, not useful. Only works in Samsung's apps. Only works in Samsung's apps. Kind of useful. Oh, finally they have that. Not useful, not useful, not useful, not useful. And it is a completely different. It is a completely different thing for consumers to wrap their head around. 3D touch, live photos, faster fingerprint reading, improved Siri on demand, where you can just say it across the room and it answers it. I don't even have the phone. And I know those are new things that it can do. I know that it does 4K video. I don't even have the phone because they have done a very clear launch. It's not. I, don't, I have not seen a single iPhone commercial. I have not read any th- other than reviews. I just happen to remember these these key features because that's what they communicate. And 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 frankly, with the exception of of HTC and often Motorola and uh, Nokia, there's really not an Android vendor that knows how to do that properly. The most of them just get all get all blurred. But anyways, we got to move on. This is way too long on this topic. One last Android story while we're while we are talking about Android. Just because I thought this, this sounded crazy. This Android app mutates source code and spreads virally and enables. This is the part I like. Mesh networks. Researchers from Delft or Delft University of Technology have developed a self-replicating mutating Android app, which can create on-the-fly mesh networks in the event of infrastructure disaster. Oh my gosh! Or maybe internet kill switch. Maybe somebody come along and you have to all of a sudden create a network on the fly. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, this is the solution. It's malware that could spread across Android devices and turn on mesh networking. The app's source code is available on GitHub and the app itself requires no root privileges to propagate. It can self-compile when it, while it mutates, for example, from a game to a calculator, they say. In transit from one Android device to another, it does this and compatibility with iOS and Windows apps or Windows phones is anticipated soon. Finally, our salvation through malware. (laughs) Android Singularity. Yeah, exactly. Uh, This next story is just a heads up for uh, the U.S. audience who has Comcast and is in this affected area. We'll have a link in the show notes. It looks like uh, for Christmas, starting in December, uh, Comcast is going to roll out new data caps. Yay! Holy crap. Yep, uh, 300 gigabyte is the monthly cap with $10 per 50 gigabyte overage fees. A copy of the notice is being sent to users to inform them that they shouldn't really worry about these caps because the medium usage for Xfinity Internet customers is only 40 gigabytes, so you probably are not going to be affected unless you're excessive. (laughs) Uh, And they're going to tell customers if you Uh, complain. We have Comcast here, don't we? Yeah, but we're business. We're business. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, They're going to tell customers if you call to complain that, look, this is all in fairness. This is in fairness, so that way the other customers can have internets too. There's only so many bits in the world, and you're taking all of the bits, so you can't have any more bits. So that's what they're going to tell you when you call in. Uh, if you are on the 300 gigabytes plan, we will send you a courtesy in-browser notice and an email. Wow! They're going to hijack your web traffic Not and insert at all. Yeah, they're going to insert an iframe Holy to let crap. you know when you're when you reach 90 percent of your 300 gigs and 100 percent. And then 110 and 125 percent of your monthly data. I feel data. like Comcast got with AT and T or something. Was like, I want to, I want to implement your data usage. Now this isn't everywhere. This isn't everywhere. So you have to check the show notes. Uh, uh, look like uh, it is in quite a few markets, but it's not 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 much on the West Coast. Oh, okay. yeah. Uh, I thought this was kind of funny. Uh, you know, the new uh, Nexus devices use USB C type connectors for charging. So a Google engineer has been on a rampage on Amazon. Uh, ben Benson, uh, I think is how you say his name, is currently on an unusual mission. He's slowly working through a bunch of USB Type C cables and adapters stocked by Amazon to check whether they're actually up to spec. So he's buying them, charging his Chromebook Pixel, and then going back and reviewing them. And some of his reviews are pretty good. 
He says uh, specifically, like uh, he's plum- providing a legit service. Yeah, he really with humor. is with his own money and yeah. humor. Yeah, and yeah. U.S. And the thing that's funny about this is, and the reason why I wanted to cover the story is because you know I have. I've been around for a while now, Ange, and I've witnessed <laughs> a, a few uh, cable uh, transitions. Uh-huh. You know, yeah. parallel port and USB and SCSI and FireWire and uh, Apple ADB and PS2 to USB and and yep. all this, uh, you know, uh, uh, BNC to Ethernet and whatever the hell, right? All these different transitions over the years, and uh, it always happens in the beginning that there are just really, really crappy, poorly manufactured connectors. Sometimes there's even fire hazards. Right. So this guy at Google, he's really helping everybody out. And he's like, I'm going to tell you, if they can't if they can't carry the full 3-amp spec, I'm going to let you know. So I thought that was pretty cool. That you is guys, really cool. You can read more about that over in the show notes if you want. All right, Ange, open up your hearts. I'm extremely <laughs> excited to say there is a new Star Trek series in the works. This is crazy. I am thrilled. It's way too far away, though. Uh, yeah, that's true. Hello, how come I don't hear anything? Go, there's supposed to be a video here. Hello, video. Oh, it's... So you'll need there we go. CBS All Access. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's the part I actually why I wanted to play the video. Trek. All right. Brand CBS new Star Trek, you guys. a brand new Star Trek TV series oh my gosh. in January 2017. Okay. Woo. But to watch anything past the first episode, you'll need CBS All Access. All right, so did you know that? Yeah, you told me that. Oh, okay, yeah, because yeah, I, yeah. I was all, I was yeah. all like... Im- immediately messaging you yeah. about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. The first day that it was announced, we were talking. I was about like, it. and I was up really early, and I, I almost sent you the message like super early. I'm like, this is gonna oh. be the morning the kids let her sleep in. I, no, yeah, right. Yeah. No, I've been up between four thirty and five thirty every morning this week. That uh, Bella. I almost swear. sent you. I almost sent you probably about that early. So, anyways, we'll we'll let it go a little farther. That's the network streaming service that costs five ninety nine a month and gives subscribers the ability to watch old and new shows on demand or Sweet. stream what's being broadcast currently. You know, CBS that's fine. All access doesn't. Yeah, I can see. If we're that. not paying eighty dollars, eighty to you know one hundred twenty dollars yeah. for cable, yeah, it's six bucks. Six bucks, meh. You, you know, know, even though we have Netflix. Yeah, you know, so you got Netflix, you got this, uh, you got YouTube, you got podcasts, and yeah. then all of a sudden you just hit your three hundred gigabyte Comcast cap. Oh yeah, right, right. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you forgot like Pandora well, or Spotify? About, yeah, or, I think about you know four K video. Uh, I the music right the uh, iTunes music. Yeah, you like got that you got all these different services. Yeah. You got four K video coming. You got YouTube doing four K video. Offer the same selection that competitors like Hulu, Netflix, and Amazon do, but the network might have actually found a good way to draw in hard hardcore Trekkies. Those who will pay will get to watch all of the new Star Trek series, which will be produced by Alex Kurtzman, the same guy who did the 2009 Star Trek movie and the 2013 follow-up, Star Trek Into Darkness. Plus, the streaming service already has all of the older Star Trek series. So you get the back catalog, cool background too. background music. Yeah. yeah, that's not bad. So Q, what is your issue? Is this, uh, do you think it uh, could be, I, for number one, I'll tell you one, it's, I, get, I guarantee it's going to be region locked for a while. But Q, what's your main issue with that, with this launch? Yeah, that's exactly my issue. I'm not <laughs> in the United States, so yeah. this is, yeah. I hate this. I, and, you know, <laughs> and for me, and not to interrupt you, too, because that is a very, very valid point, but uh, I, I live in the rover, <laughs> right? So am I going to stream every episode over a cellular connection? That's not mm-hmm. ideal. I can do it. I'll tell you what it's probably going to happen. It's probably going to end up on Usenet, and it's going to end up on my right. hard drive. I oh, know. I was just going to say, like, somebody could see it. <laughs> <laughs> somebody could see it, so could cute, see it for I mean, those uh, out of country. So this is the thing, is I think this is, uh, this is like... Um, this has got to be. This is like got to be smothering, smothering this project before it even gets a chance to to really breathe air, because uh, you're going to limit it behind this paywall like this. You're artificially reducing the amount of people that can watch it just right there. Mm-hmm. It's a, It's going to be. A, it, there's no way it'll be. There's no. How can Paramount possibly say this was a financial success if this series is going to be any good? If it's going to be well produced and they're going to pay their actors well, they're going to pay their writers well, their producers, their directors, their camera operators, they're going to have great effects. If they're going to do all of these things that make a Star Trek series. Why limit the audience? Well, how could you possibly, how many, how many millions of subscribers would you have to have to sign up? Right. Well, there's merchandising too and. Um, Selling the discs. Well, and, yeah. The, the worst part is, is that Paramount doesn't own the TV series. It's so stupid. CBS owns the TV series rights. And Paramount owns the movie rights. It is the stupidest setup I've ever seen. Yeah, it's very complicated. Or, oh, it's awful. Either one of two things will happen. Um, or we are going to see very uh, cheap shows 
uh, or it's going to be canceled after a few episodes. Really. No way. Some of the some of the people behind it. So they're going to air the uh, premiere, I guess, on TV, and the rest will be all online. Some of the people behind it are some of the people involved in the 2009 movie as well, the reboot. So as is the internet's way, there's already a Change.org <laughs> petition to cancel the new Star Trek series before it even has a chance to air. Andrews, what do you think of that? It has been it is like thrown down right now. It is like war against CBS. Uh, Wait, so how is this going to make a difference? How is how is that even going to possibly prevent it? Don't they say they they want them? The fans want them to stop it right now. They say you're going to f it up. For this reason, we demand you cancel the new series now. 14 months before we ever see what it might have looked like. No, it's it's going to happen, and it's going to be awesome. They say the evidence is damning. The utter disrespect for the fan base is staggering. This is all kind of tongue in cheek. Wow. Uh, they say also we demand quality. Star Trek has a long history of impeccable drama and storytelling. We will accept nothing less. Oh my goodness. Uh, what's up with charging us? Six bucks. We Star Trek fans uh, are not. Uh, uh, we Star Trek fans are not used to being gouged for money by corporate money. That's not true at all. Uh, right. In summation, this is what they want. Well, not to mention, it's probably going to be weekly, right? I, so, I don't know. They haven't actually said yet, which is also concerning oh. because that fundamentally alters how. You, if you do release them all at once versus weekly, that alters the DNA of the show. Yeah. Uh, here's the here huh. in summation. The p- Change.org petition wants to be clear. They say we want it for free, but first we want you to cancel it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so there you go. They they're up in arms <laughs> over there. They're up in arms over there. I don't know what's gonna happen, but I'm 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 excited. And our end of show clip will tell you why. I, I actually have had time to reflect on the new Star Trek movies and I'm not so pessimistic about it. Mumble room, any last thoughts before we move on to our Kickstarter of the week? It sounds to me like it's gonna to get to the point where every single website that you have to pay to use and there's gonna be people who use, like, only use like one or two sites and that's it. Oh, that's a sad note. And of course, then you have uh, cell companies like T-Mobile who are going to start offering streaming from Hulu and Netflix for free. Mm. Which, uh, if you're on a T-Mobile now, you if you stream audio from Spotify or Google Play Music, or you watch videos from Netflix, this yes, what that's great. They're not going to. It's not going to count against your data. Yeah, that's exactly. It's not great though at all. It's horrible. See, but that's why because it sounds great. But now, if think about this, if you're on the verge of deciding whether to listen to a Jupiter Broadcasting podcast, oh, sure. while you're okay. driving. <laughs> You can't what? consider my own company? No. <laughs> right. So now your options are, well, I can right. do Spotify, or I can do this for free, or I could pay to listen to Jupiter sure. Broadcasting. I just don't like being penalized to listen to music. I know. Well, it's because you know? it's because be- it's this whole concept that what the problem is is the bits aren't precious. It's their network infrastructure that's precious, right. and they right. just need to properly invest in network infrastructure. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. That's all. All right, Angela, are you ready for some cool Kickstarter of the week? Kick it! All right, this is coming in. Uh, I, I believe it was Mike eighty nine that submitted this one. I think you say it's pronounced Hudway. It's Hudway Glass, like like a HUD, like a heads up display. Hudway Glass. It keeps your eyes on the road while driving. It's got eight thousand four hundred ninety backers. They're trying to raise one hundred thousand dollars. They've already raised five hundred eighty thousand wow. dollars with twenty six hours to go. It's a weekend blowout, you guys. Based on official statistics, there are 600 million people who get behind the wheel of their cars every single day, and 75% of them use their smartphone while driving. Hello Kickstarter, my name is Ivan, and today I'm extremely proud to introduce Hardware Glass. It is a simple smartphone accessory that turns your smartphone into a head-up display. You see that? Just like any fighter jet or luxury car. <laughs> We've been working on improving safety and comfort of a driver for three years. We started with a navigation app, which transforms our vision on how cell phones can Owl. be used in cars. <laughs> By now, over 1 million drivers have tried our app, and one customer even told us it saved his life. <laughs> if he's driving like that. Hardware Glass <laughs> was inspired by rally racing. Oh, when okay. you are driving 120 miles per hour, all your attention is focused on the road ahead. To look away, even for a second, is extremely dangerous. Putting a head-up display in a race car is one thing, but we realize regular drivers face all the same distractions and more using their smartphones while driving. We put it to the test. The two most common distractions are reading directions of your phone and and checking your speedometer. This causes us to drive blind for approximately 300 feet on every mile. On a typical 10-mile trip, we are distracted and driving blind for over half a mile. Using hardware glass, this distraction time is reduced to nearly zero. Head-up displays in cars do exist already, but they tend to be very expensive and usually found only on luxury vehicles. Some companies are developing more affordable devices, 
but they still cost several hundred dollars and are stuck in the midst of a very long and complicated development process. So you still cannot buy them today. At Hardway, we took a simpler route. Let's face it, your smartphone already has everything you need to project data on a windshield. Big and bright display, GPS, internet, sensors. The only thing is missing is a special optical glass to provide you high quality reflection of your screen, day or night, rain or shine. Well, the only thing missing isn't missing anymore. Imagine that you already have head up display in your car. All you need is just an accessory for your smartphone. Imagine all navigation information is in front of your eyes all the time. Imagine music control, conference calls, or catching up with your robot friend Siri. <laughs> there are no <laughs> limits. You can use any app on Power any robot. smartphone that supports head-up display mode. Now, there's no need to take your hands off the wheel or your eyes off the road. It's a safer and more comfortable ride. What do you think about that? What do you think about that? I call bull, bull crap. I feel like I'm in a sci-fi movie. Oh, yeah. Really? Well, sorry. No. Why do you call it uh, BS? That just, okay, you, you still will have to touch your phone. Like, you can't, you can't do, you're not on the phone, you're not on, you're not looking down at your phone because you don't know what the road just in front of you looks like. You know, like the, the corner. Yeah, that's true. Which is mostly what they showed. Yeah. Also, because it goes in horizontally, all texts are going to be displayed this way. You're going to have to turn, you know, taco neck syndrome. Oh, geez. TNS. All right, Derek Devlin, what do you think? I think I think Angie's right on spot, and not only that, not only that. I mean, self-driving cars is what we're going. Yeah, for. let's go for that. We're... Just skip this. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, <laughs> honestly, yeah. You know, I was kind of liking it because I was thinking about when I was on the road trip. Navigation, yeah. If it's giving you directions, also, yes. But that's all it the is. Problem yeah. that they, the problem that they are describing is your attention span, right? Because you're looking at that uh, for whatever information you're looking. For. Mm -hmm. Your speedometer is one of the things that they mentioned. You're still going to be looking at that screen and ignoring your Your brain is going to filter what's outside of the screen and right. focus on what in content you're absorbing. So right. In See, sense, yeah. You're not gaining anything. The picture that he, you hmm. have up right now, the head-up display, you can read that all fine, but the background is blurred because you're focusing on the forefront. So uh, I here's how I would actually use this, like on the road trip. I would have like a phone that's just dedicated to this, and I would still have to have my main phone. <laughs> You know, they didn't want to show Facebook on there. <laughs> so, like, literally, why are people on their phones? Like, they didn't they didn't address that. Like, I have most of our cars, even if they're not luxury and have the head-up display, they have navigation. And if you don't have navigation, you have a TomTom -tom or well, and they uh, have, whatever. they have voice prompts, too. Oh, that's cool, but... Uh, no, I mean, nav does. Like, you've, that's oh, the ultimate yeah. not take your ro eyes yeah. off the road. In fact, some cars only have voice nav. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of well, neat, though. Thing. I do kind of, I like it. I still could, I would still like to have something like this. It's just maybe it should come from Garmin. Yeah. Go ahead. One thing I noticed is, I mean, if, if you are going to use something like this, you're going to want to use uh, voice commands with your phone so you don't have to actually touch it, right? Right. And one thing I noticed, if you have a vehicle with a loud engine, um, mm -hmm. it doesn't work nearly as well. If, yeah. Uh, Okay, Google thing pops up out of nowhere, even though if, even if I wasn't talking uh, or uh, even if I didn't say anything that sounds remotely like okay, Google, yeah. it, it turns itself on. Um, so if you drive a car that's relatively new, you are probably fine. If you are driving a truck, like a diesel truck, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, yeah, uh, yeah. not necessarily as good. Or even, though, a, even a gas, gas truck pulling, it, it can be pretty loud. It would make I, for some interesting uh, blooper videos. Yeah, and here's <laughs> the biggest first world problem of them all, and I admit this is this is like a problem that I, I, I try not to get upset about, but uh, so my truck has Bluetooth integration. Yay, finally. God, I like listening, to, it makes it so much better listening to podcasts. It's great. Except for it also means that it, is, it uses the microphone in the truck for my phone's microphone when it's connected. You know what I mean? Like it takes over yeah. as the microphone input. Yeah. So any anytime I go to do like a text to speech or if I want to trigger like a hey Google or something like that, uh, there is the delay while the truck's AV system switches from audio playback and switches over oh, to phone mode and then opens up the like the phone book and all that stuff and then opens up the microphone. Mm -hmm. And so there's like a one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, doo doo, now it's ready. Right. And it's just enough that it throws off 
every single program. And it's about 300 feet of that mile. Yeah, and, and they're like, and the programs are like, why aren't you talking? I'm ready for you. Why aren't you? I don't hear anything. And I'm like, did you get? get and then as soon as do it, then it's right. Like, oh, oh, then it stops. <laughs> and so it it is obviously the world's largest first world problem. But what it makes is like this supposedly distraction free, uh, easy to use your phone while you're driving thing. Uh, it actually makes it really I, frustrating. I thought you were going to talk and about distracting. how you've only had one car out of, I don't know, I don't even. So oh, what? I had a, maybe you 10. You can't okay, give me a hard so, time anymore because okay, I had, on, you know, what I realized no, is oh. that having the truck for eight years me makes, a, makes it totally, made me totally legit. That made no, like, I was well, like a legit. Okay. There eight, were, you, yeah. Eight years on a vehicle okay. is not bad when you're yes. 30. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But anyway, you've only had one car out of the 10 or so that you've had that had digital speedometer. That's true. That's true. And that is one thing that this offers that I could see you geeking out yeah, over. Yeah, but you know, I can get that today with uh, different nav apps and stuff. Oh, okay. In fact, I've, there are already heads-up display apps in the App Store. Oh. You just put it up there on your windshield. Yeah, right. <laughs> kind of like a dork, I guess. But <laughs> I just, uh, I don't know. I, I think it's an inch, you know, as somebody who drove around a lot, I, I did something that most people couldn't do, but I was kind of testing different cellular connectivity. So I, I had, uh, I had a Android phone and an iPhone with me, mm-hmm. and I used the Android phone primarily for what Android does really great: Google Maps, Waze, navigation, and searching for stuff. And I used the iPhone for things like podcasts, audiobooks. Uh, hyperlapses and things like that. So I'm actually one of these guys. It's weird enough that I could actually dedicate a phone to this and still have my phone with me while I'm going around. All right, Mumble Room. Any final thoughts? Anybody thinking about maybe backing this or closing thoughts? I have one more concern that oh, like. this could potentially have. That's why I'm not backing this. Okay, what's the last? Yeah. I find the idea interesting. Actually, I thought about building something like this about a year ago, but using Raspberry Pi instead of a phone because I don't want the extra distractions. But my concern here is that when I drive at night on the highway, so there's a very little outside light sources, there's no street lights, houses, etc. I will dim all the lights inside the cab um, or inside the car uh, to the minimum settings, right? Because the light on the inside is distracting um, mm-hmm. and annoying to your eyes. What are my settings with this? If I control with my phone, do I have to go into like my phone settings and control uh, my brightness? You have an is Android, there, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, you have yeah. an Android. Yeah. Yeah. iPhones automatically I, dim in the dark. No, no, they well, all do. You can. That's all settings. That's all you can change. All that. They all can yeah, do that. Ca- yeah, you would have to adjust yeah. the phone brightness. Yeah, and you also notice that uh, you, you have to use apps. I don't know if you caught this in the pictures, Ange, but one of the common themes about all the pictures, uh, maybe I still have it up, is they have to have a certain. Um, like contrast to them, right? Look, they, they, there's a certain color scheme that's only going to work in, in light conditions when it's reflected up on the screen. Mm-hmm. So not only are you going to have to jack your brightness all the way up, but I would think, like Andrew's saying, if it's in the windshield and you have an automatic and it's in that much light, it's going to jack itself up to full brightness anyways. Because when, it's, when there's a lot of ambient light around, the screen has to work harder so that way you can see it over that light. So, yeah, I think... Yeah, but that's the issue. Like, it, the app potentially knows that in most conditions it has to be very bright in order to uh, yes. for you to be able to battery see drain it's a battery drain well yes. yeah but then at night is it still going to do that be try to be very bright so i can see even though it doesn't need to like, so if you have uh, automa- it's, if it's you have it automatic tricky, right? yeah yeah uh if you have an automatic all right uh one more uh from the mom room and then we'll wrap it up i think there wasn't there one more what? it doesn't seem that to have anything to stick it well by the way yeah it looked like a tracky pad kind of thing maybe yeah it's so a big distraction now. The more we talk about this, because it's draining batteries, so you're gonna have to have a cord. You're gonna have to get a it's like. Imagine the setup. You gotta launch the app, get the cord up there. Don't automatically push the button or lock the screen while you're setting it up on the thing. Depending on how deep your dashboard is, you're gonna be leaning over your steering wheel. Yeah, I'm surprised it's actually got five hundred thousand dollars. Now we talk about it. You make a curve. Yeah, go sliding up. Boop, 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 boop. Down and down, and then get scratched then up because phone. your floor is dirty. Yeah. Bye. All right. All right. Now I hate it. I, at first I wanted it because it reminded me of the road trip and how that would have been nice. And then so I saw I had five hundred thousand dollars, and now you guys have all debunked a bunch of. We should call. We should. We should call this the Kickstarter Skeptic Hour. Let's get out of the Kickstarter of the week. That's. Uh, there we go. Clear it out of here. All right, Andrews. So uh, no tech talk next week, like I mentioned at the top of the show, because of the System Seventy Six trip. But we should have some good content from that. And if all goes as planned. We should have a live stream of the System 76 event Thursday, live from System 76. So and be then live last Friday. Friday, yeah. So yep. there'll be content on Thursday and Friday on the live stream. You can We should hopefully get that up on the calendar. Yep. And also, if you're in the area, I did start a thread in the meetup at meetup.com slash broadcasting, just kind of trying to take the pulse of who might be in the Denver area. 
and want to meet up next week. Mumble Room, thank you guys very much for being here. I'd invite everybody out there to join us. Go to jblive.tv for future live streams. Check jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar for when that is. TechTalkToday.reddit.com is where you go to submit stories, end of show clips, things that might be great, Kickstarters of the week. All of that is good. And Ange, thank you for joining me too. Yep. All right. So I'm going to, this might get us pulled off of YouTube, but uh, Woo. I wanted to play a clip since this is Star Trek week. I have been back and forth on if the new Star Trek reboots are uh, really just horrible for Star Trek or actually really genuine to Star Trek. And knowing that some of the people that created the new Star Trek movies are going to be working on the, on the new TV series, I've been doubling down on this recently. You know, it's important things to think about. And uh, in some ways, I was kind of looking back and realizing how much Star Trek itself has changed over the years. And people would have said, oh, that's not true to Star Trek. And uh, so this clip is uh, some great work on YouTube that I wanted to play. And I think it really goes through and kind of does some really good analysis of, uh, of this particular question and kind of makes me look forward to the new Star Trek series, even though we were all just kind of hating on it. I, after watching this clip, was excited and also feel better about the new Star Trek movies. So I leave you with this little bit, little piece, little bit of peace for the weekend. Unless you're going to join us on Friday for the Linux Action Show. Then it's going to get crazy. See you next time, everybody. Thanks for joining us. The new Star Trek films have been pretty polarizing. Okay, maybe really polarizing. But when I consider the fans who so desperately hate these films, I can only scratch my head. In my eyes, these movies are the truest love song to the original series since the show was canceled in 1969. Many fans tend to forget that Star Trek was already rebooted before J.J. came along. Back in 1979 with the motion picture, it had a different tone different uniforms, new characters, an entirely redesigned visual style. Do these even look like the same franchise? Let alone the same alien species? So why is it that some fans were enraged when J.J. Abrams introduced a Star Trek film that was actually shockingly similar to the original series? Bright colors, scantily clad women, creepy alien atmosphere, fun action adventure scenes, wild animal attacks, I could go on. Contrary to what some disgruntled fans would have you believe, the writers of these movies really get the original series in a way that no other Trek movie did. In fact, the classic films didn't even acknowledge that the original series existed. They all seem to take place in this alternate universe that has little to no- wait, that sounds like the way some people talk about the JJ films, but it's true. Many were upset about Spock and Ahura's romance, for instance. But they obviously didn't watch the original series where Spock and Ahura had a thing for each other. We've just forgotten about it. In another lifetime or another universe, they might have been romantically involved. And JJ's films exploring that is actually expanding on a concept from the original series. Or take Chekhov, for example. In the original series, he was actually a pretty useful guy to have around. So useful, in fact, that he often fills in for Mr. Spock. No easy task. But in the classic Trek movies, he's just extra baggage. He has to be there for the poster or the trailer. But he has nothing to do and it seems like he has no special skills except for being that silly Russian guy. But JJ's films remember that Chekhov used to be a capable character. You can do it, sir. I can do that. I can do that. He's introduced to us as the Russian whiz kid, which is totally appropriate. But only to his character in the original series not the two-dimensional caricature from the classic films. JJ's writers are so familiar with how the original series was that they can work in references that even hardcore Trekkies might miss. Let's look at this scene from the original series. My commander wishes to speak with you, Captain Kirk. Look familiar? My commander requests the presence of your captain. Or how about this? Aren't you the one that always says a little suffering is good for the soul? I never said that. Where are we? Medical bay. This is worth it. Little suffering is good for the soul. Hey, how are you? The writers apparently even watched the animated series. Your father brought Shane to Vulcan. He married a human. He's a traitor, you know. Your father, for marrying her. That human whore. Logic offers a serenity humans seldom experience in full. Logic offers a serenity humans seldom experience. The time draws near when you will have to decide whether you will follow Vulcan or human philosophy. The question you face is, which path will you choose? When did Prime Trek ever acknowledge the animated series? Or how about this? Even I, a half-Vulcan, 
could hear the death scream of 400 Vulcan mines crying out over the distance between us. I had experienced those feelings before, multiplied exponentially on the day my planet was destroyed. Such a feeling is something I choose never to experience again. You speak about the objective hardness of the Vulcan heart, yet how little room there seems to be in yours. These movies are jam-packed with character moments and references to classic Trek. And yet, many of the naysayers think that the writers didn't know anything about Star Trek, without realizing all the references and connections they themselves missed. With all this consistency and connection, it's easy to see that the J.J. films are actually truer to original Star Trek than anything that came after 1969. And maybe that's part of the problem. Trekkies have gotten so used to the post-TOS reality, the one where Kirk is aging and insecure, the one where the color is gone and the lights are low. And eventually, the next generation rebooted Star Trek yet again with a new style, new designs, and entirely new characters. The action-packed, colorful interstellar romp was over long ago. Now, Star Trek is about politics and muted discussions about ethics. And when J.J. gave fans a blast from the past wrapped up in a high budget and modern style, many fans felt betrayed. It was nothing like their Star Trek. And that's exactly right. J.J. films are nothing like the majority of Star Trek, but they're exactly like the first three seasons that started it all. And that's something really special 